right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me? Make sure this thing's, being tall is tough sometimes. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks everybody for showing up this morning. Uh, I'm here to talk about my research I've been uh, doing during my doctoral thesis and now as a postdoc. And uh, hopefully it makes a lot of sense. I'll try to make it as clear as I can. I'm a, a basic science researcher, so sometimes I talk to a lot of academics, so it can be a little challenging to communicate the things I do to everybody else. But hopefully you can follow along. I'll try to make it as clear as I can. All right, so starting off, uh, so autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, a very long name, so I'll be calling it either PKD um, for short, so if you see that acronym show up, that's uh, what I'm talking about. So it's a uh, monogenic disease, so that means it's caused by a single gene mutation. There's a handful of different uh, PKD uh, types of diseases that are caused by many other mutations, but the one that I'm pr primarily interested in is the one that's uh, associated with the uh, PKD1 gene or the PKD2 gene. These account for the majority of the cases um, that we see in PKD or AD PKD. This thing I feel like is right in my way. <laughs> All right, so uh, the first one is the PKD1 protein uh, or the PKD1 gene that codes for this protein polycystin 1. Uh, it has a lot of functions which makes it really challenging to study. So nobody really totally understands everything that it does yet. Um, but some of the more interesting things that we're, uh, that we know that it does is it, is it affects um, cellular proliferation, uh, and now more interestingly in metabolism. So it seems to be central to a lot of different effects in the cell. Uh, this disease, uh, it affects a lot of people. So about one in 400, there's some of the estimates. Uh, so about 600,000 people in America alone. Um, this is about 10 million worldwide. Um, it's slowly progressing, and that's an important point to, my, uh, to all my research, is that it doesn't show up and manifest itself until later in life. Uh, people were diagnosed usually early on in adulthood because of a, a familial, uh, uh, they'll know that they have PKD, somebody in, their, in their, um, their family, they'll be tested, but then they have renal function fine for many years, and then at some point they eventually succumb to renal failure, and then they need a kidney transplant or lifelong dialysis. And this is really the, the issue of this problem is that it doesn't show up for a long time, so you know people don't really, don't really worry about it, and all of a sudden they're stuck on dialysis, and at that point, you only have one to two years in which you can survive at that point before needing a kidney transplant or dying, one of those two. Um, the other thing is that cyst formation is still poorly understood, so that's where I get to come in, so I get to do a lot of my work from that. Um, but so why do we study PKD? Um, the main reason that we, we study this is because it is very expensive on our healthcare system. Uh, most of the dialysis, you know, is coming from uh, kidney failure, chronic kidney disease, and one of the big percentages of this is from PKD. So um, it can cost up to $850,000 a year in some instances just to keep people on dialysis. Uh, this uh, loss or this uh, cost goes up as kidney function declines, and this is because people have it a more difficult time working. Uh, their families need to take care of them. You know, taking people to dialysis is a, a you know very expensive thing to do. Um, you know, they have to go multiple times a week. They sit there for hours at a time. So it's uh, it's very costly to the individual and their families. Uh, right now, just recently, the uh, tolvaptin is the first approved PKD therapy. Uh, this is uh, this is about fifty-seven hundred dollars a month if you want to take this drug, um, but it has a lot of side effects, and uh, it, because it's a vasopressin agonist, uh, you have to pee all the time. So if if you want to <laughs> if you want to go to the bathroom multiple times a day and for a minimal uh, effect on um, decreasing the progression of the disease, that's the way to go. But it doesn't look like that's a great option for people. Um, but as I mentioned, because it's slowly progressing, uh, if we can just figure out a way to slow down the progression, then we effectively cure the disease because you don't, if you can just spread the disease to go to your 80s, 90s, you know, it's pretty much a, a cure at that point. So uh, trying to extend it towards the end of life would be the, the goal. So here's a, uh, a kind of a graph that shows the progression of PKD. Uh, it starts off pretty early on with just small cysts that form throughout the kidney. Um, it starts to progress more and more as people get older, and there's also these other manifestations of the disease. Uh, people develop hypertension. Uh, they have some uh, other um, aneurysms can be a secondary effect of the disease because of the blood pressure regulation. Um, but also, kidney function starts to decline, and so people start to form uh, kidney stones, uh, uh, infections in the kidney, all sorts of other 
uh, uh, manifestations of the disease. And you can see at the very end there, the kidney is almost completely covered with cysts. And if you imagine, if you take your fist and you think about a fist as being the normal size of a kidney, and then you take your hands and you go about this far, that's about the size of the kidney becomes. So somewhere about a size of a football or larger by the time that it's actually manifested um, to the end stage of PKD. So this slowly progressive nature of the disease um, kind of gives us a little idea about how it might be actually functioning. So you start off with a normal uh, copy of this PKD1 allele, and then at some point you end up with a mutation in the gene line, or the germ line, and that is a, now you have this heterozygous mutation, and then uh, nothing happens, but at some point we believe that there is a secondary mutation in the uh, somatic mutation that would be in the cyst itself, and then Finally, nothing happens until you injure the kidney, and at that point, a uh, cyst seems to form. And this is backed up by a lot of experimental research that shows that treating kidneys with, um, in this context with uh, mercuric chloride, which is not a very common thing people run into in their everyday life, or ischemia reperfusion, where you actually cut off the blood supply to a kidney and then let it go back in, or removing one of the kidneys and letting the other one grow in compensation, um, that will all trigger cyst formation if you have both of these genes mutated. Uh, none of these seem to be things that happen to people normally, so it's kind of confusing, like what is actually the trigger for cis formation in humans. And this is where we, uh, we got our ideas that go forward from here. So I want to introduce this idea of microcrystals and kidney stones. So microcrystals, when I'm referring to those, it's talking about these subclinical uh, precipitates in the, um, in the kidney. And so these can be made up of lots of different substances, primarily oxalate, uh, uric acid, or phosphate. Those are the most common. Those, seem, those are really attracted to calcium, so they form these little tiny crystals. And when they get big enough, they form a, a kidney stone. So that's what we kind of know when uh, it actually manifests as something that we r recognize. Um, and we know that diet um, is affects how much of these stones are formed. Um, so from an evolutionary question is, uh, how do kidneys deal with these microcrystals normally? Because we form them all the time. Uh, we can look at urine and we can find out that they're there, so there must be some way that we deal with them. And so we're thinking that, for, as a hypothesis, maybe these cysts are just formed because of injury uh, or inappropriate response to crystal formation. So uh, looking at what, how this kind of fits in with uh, PKD, uh, we know that, they're, that crystals are formed in the general population, and if you look at urine, you'll find them in uh, you know, up to a quarter of every urine that you, that you look at, you'll find uh, crystals in there. Uh, they are more common as individuals age, uh, they're common more in PKD patients, and they're also more common in males, and we know that males have a more severe PKD phenotype. So these all kind of mirror the progression of the disease. We also know that from some re animal research that if you treat animals with uh, citrate, they seem to get better, so the disease doesn't progress as quickly. And before, this was kind of unexplainable, but we also know that citrate is a chelator of calcium, so it pulls excess calcium out of the, the urine, so this might be a, uh, a way to prevent crystal f uh, formation. So uh, I've treated some, some some uh, PKD rats with, a, uh, with citrate myself and found that we saw these, norm under normal conditions, these black spots, these are, um, this is a stain for oxalate crystals. You can find these crystals all th in these cysts um, throughout the kidney, but then when we treat with citrate, they're almost completely gone, and that's just after one week of, of citrate treatment. So this is kind of supporting that maybe this is one of the uh, ways this is working. So our model is, uh, if you look up at the top, you can kind of see a normal tubule where the uh, fluid flows through without any, um, any impairment. Uh, at some point, a crystal will form and then block fluid flow. We think at this point that this is when it activates some of these, um, these cellular pathways that are involved in tubule dilation. Uh, they're activated in order to kind of clear up the crystal. And then when the crystal goes away, these pathways turn off and the tubule goes back to normal. But under a PKD uh, context where they have loss of these polycystins, they would then go on to form a cyst. So we think that maybe tubule dilation is the normal process to get rid of crystals and that this is defective in polycystic kidney disease. Some support to this is a disease called primary hyperoxaluria, where humans, uh, they have a mutation that causes them to form a lot of calcium oxalate crystals. These little shiny spots, those are um, calcium oxalate crystals. They're really easy to see under a polarizing microscope. So we can just look at them and you see that there's plenty of them in these uh, primary hyperoxaluric patients. And when we uh, look at and some of the signaling pathways, um, so this, these um, red marks here, these are a marker for the um, protein mTOR. So we look at 
these everywhere it's red, that means that mTOR is active. We see that under P in PKD, these cyst lining cells are very strongly activated for mTOR, and also in the primary hyperoxaluric uh, patients. So that we're showing that this is a um, kind of a similar mechanism by which these um, cells are hyperactive for mTOR. And we also know that when we inhibit mTOR, this is research done in our lab as well, that if you inhibit mTOR in a PKD mouse model, that they are not, the cysts do not progress as, uh, as fast, and they actually kind of look almost normal at the, in adults. So in wild-type rats, so this is uh, one of the first experiments we did, we just inject animals with a, a dose of sodium oxalate, so they start to form all of these crystals very quickly. Uh, after six hours, you can see a lot of these crystals are already starting to form. 24 hours, the tubules begin to dilate, so they start to, these crystals are becoming less apparent. And after three days, you see a lot of tubule dilation and very few crystals left in the kidney. And after seven days, the tubules look almost completely normal again. So they've cleared out the crystals and are recovered after a full week of, um, of this process. Uh, we see that when you treat with uh, these, these animals with this, these oxalate crystals, they have, again, activated mTOR. And if you treat with the inhibitor rapamycin, which is a, it blocks the activity of mTOR, these tubules, they still dilate, but not to the same extent, and the uh, mTOR signal is cut off. When we looked at a uh, bunch of different tubule segments, so it's not important what the, the two markers are for the different tubule segments. All you need to look at is that they don't dilate when we treat with the rapamycin. So this is showing that mTOR seems to be uh, intimately linked to this dilation process. So um, this is kind of in support of our model that it is these overactive uh, mTOR signaling that leads to tubule dilation and cyst formation in PKD. So uh, these are an normal wild-type animals, so we wanted to test this in a PKD model. Uh, instead of the acute injection, where we treat them with just one time with sodium oxalate, we treat them with ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol leads to the formation of calcium oxalate crystals, but this is over a longer period of time. So we start with at week three, so as soon as they're weaned, they, be, they now start drinking a uh, water filled with <laughs> ethylene glycol. I wouldn't encourage that. And then at, uh, after five weeks, we look at the kidneys. So at eight weeks old, you already can see that these uh, kidneys are much larger. They have a lot more cysts, and uh, this pol under polarizing microscopy, you can see there's a ton of these little microcrystals all over the, the kidney. Uh, interestingly, females, they don't form crystals, and they also do not get more cystic. So this is a good negative control for our experiment. So this is showing that this is not an effect of oxalate alone, but actually because of the crystal formation. Uh, to back this up even further and show this is not a calcium oxalate specific effect, uh, we treated another model of PKD with a uh, high phosphorus diet, so now they form these calcium phosphate crystals, and they too become more cystic. Um, but in, different from the previous model, females are the ones who are more susceptible to calcium phosphate crystal deposition, and they become more cystic. So this is again uh, showing that this is not just a, um, you know, some other artifact of our treatment, but actually crystal specific. These crystals also activate mTOR, and so they we're just showing here that these crystals are deposited in these uh, active sites of where um, cysts are forming. All right, so that's the uh, first half of my talk. So that's showing, what I want to remind everybody is that mTOR is important in PKD. We already knew that, and so that was just the um, kind of the central player in our hypothesis. So we just showed that it's active also when we treat these animals and have they form crystals. Uh, we we're arguing that crystals activate mTOR, and that's, the, um, that's what's leading to tubule dilation, and I showed that if you inhibit mTOR activity, you can inhibit that dilation effect, uh, and that we showed that cyst uh, formation is exacerbated by crystal uh, in different models of uh, PKD. All right, so these data, they kind of uh, give, a, give us an idea that maybe just treating uh, the citrate could be an effective treatment for PKD, so if we can prevent these crystals, maybe that will be a uh, of effective treatment. And uh, it also supports our initial hypothesis. So a lot of good stuff there. Uh, let's keep on going. <laughs> so next one, ADPKD and metabolism. So I mentioned that ADPKD uh, is a, you know, that mutation in polysystem one kind of, a, you know, controls a lot of different functions, and one of them is metabolism. And it looks like th um, the more we do research on, on ADPKD, we find that it's actually a disease of metabolic inflexibility. And uh, these PKD cells, they prefer glucose over, uh, over any other fuel substrate. So they actually have a lot of similarity to what we call the Warburg effect in cancer cells. And we know that if we treat um, 
and cells, these PKD cells with a lot of different ways to disrupt glucose metabolism, they'll, uh, they become better. So if you treat with different things that either block glycolysis or increase fatty acid oxidation, you can actually uh, rescue a lot of these uh, animals. And there's a lot of research already done on that. Uh, so one of the things we're thinking about is maybe glucose deprivation is a way to, um, to use as a therapeutic window. So uh, I think people know where that's going. So the Warburg effect, uh, if I just remind everybody, is that in normal conditions, uh, cells are able to either use uh, oxidative phosphorylation, so that means they use oxygen, and they can burn up glucose uh, that way by through the mitochondria or through fatty acid oxidation, or they can do anaerobic uh, oxidation or anaerobic um, glycolysis where they just uh, create lactate from pyruvate, but this is kind of the only pathway that's uh, available to cancer cells or cells that are proliferating. They seem to be kind of... Uh, very dependent on glucose, and they almost primarily use all of their energy from glucose and prefer to do nothing with the mitochondria. So you end up seeing a lot of uh, damaged mitochondria in these um, dependent cells. So our question was, uh, can we just use the body's own physiology to kind of regulate cyst growth? And so is glucose withdrawal a sufficient uh, way to do this? Uh, so when we're looking at targeting the different metabolic pathways in PKD, the one thing we looked at first is beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so everybody's fam probably familiar with that compound by now through the ketogenic diet. Uh, it's also a very important signaling molecule besides its energetic functions. And in PKD, all these different pathways were, are kind of regulated by uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so it's, you know, it's got so many different, it's hand in so many different pathways, it's kind of, a, it's kind of silly, like that nobody's thought of this already. So in our, uh, in our research, in our lab, we'd, we'd had done a, an experiment with, on caloric restriction in PKD mice, and we found that when you reduce their caloric intake by 20%, uh, they got much better. But one of the issues with this, um, this treatment is that, uh, or in many of the studies that are done on caloric restriction, is um, kind of the experimental design. So animals are given all their food once a day, so they give them like, um, you know, you restrict food, you imagine the next time you get food, you're going to be pretty hungry, so they eat all their food very quickly. So they're actually getting a long period of time in which they do not consume any calories. So this is actually probably a time-restricted feeding model or intermittent fasting model, not a caloric restriction. So being able to figure out is this um, due to caloric restriction alone or to some other fasting uh, effect is, our, is kind of the goal of this next project. So what we decide, you know, this is kind of uh, highlighted here. You know, if you give a mouse his cheese, he's going to eat it all, and if you you give him mouse his cheese once a day, he's gonna run away and eat it all right away, and then he's gonna be stuck waiting for that cheese to come back, and he knows it's coming, and when he, but he's gonna have to wait. So uh, that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the, the paradox here, is like what is actually going on? Is this time-restricted feeding, or is this uh, caloric restriction? So uh, time-restricted feeding, if you're not familiar, is just giving all of the food within a designated feeding window. This is ad libitum. So our experiment, we gave them an uh, eight-hour feeding window, uh, 16 hours the rest of the time they were fasted. They had all the, w all the water they wanted. And during this feeding, uh, fasting period, uh, they're going to have an increase in beta-hydroxybutyrate. At least that's the goal. So we, we did measure that. And it was the case. So the way this works is the uh, animals are allowed food access uh, ad libitum either um, all the time as the controls or during the uh, dark period because um, mice and rats are nocturnal. So that made the experiment a little more challenging for the researchers. We had to go in at night and do all this work. So it was a little more challenging. Um, but it, uh, it paid off as it actually works. So, <laughs> so we gave them all their food in that eight-hour window in the dark period. And then we looked at their kidneys. Um, we found that the uh, time-restricted feeding animals, uh, you know, you can see that they still have cysts, but the kidneys did not grow at the same rate, and the cysts were actually much smaller. Um, when we looked to see if they, what their caloric intake was, we found that the, uh, the amount of calories they were eating was similar to their ad libitum controls. Um, so this was not an effect due to caloric restriction. Uh, we also looked at a uh, change in body weight um, for males and females. They also kind of mimicked each other for the, uh, both groups. And so we could conclude that this effect was not due to caloric restriction. So I think that's very promising. Uh, we also found that mTOR was a decreased in these animals. So this is one of the effects we assumed would, would be the case. Uh, we saw that in these cis lining cells that you can see the ad libitum animals have the very strong s signals that's seen in green, and the time-restricted feeding animals do not. Uh, what we also found was that there was a decrease in these myofibroblasts. So these are really important for um, scarring the kidney. 
one of the problems that happens in PKD is that they form a lot of fibrosis. So the fibrosis is really where you lose kidney function because that replaces uh, normal kidney um, with this scarred kidney tissue that does not have any function. And once it's there, it's kind of there forever. And uh, these green cells, their job is to lay down collagen. So they sit there and they just excrete collagen and they exacerbate the disease. And um, on the time-restricted animals, they're almost completely absent. So that we think that this might be one of the things that underlies what actually is going on in these animals, why they don't get more cystic. And we measured that, so we just measured the number of cells. That's that graph there, just shows that there's a huge decrease in the number of these uh, smooth actin positive cells, that's SMA. And uh, we saw just as a, at the phenotypic level, there's a reduction in the collagen deposition. So that red stain there is the fibrosis, and you, it's almost absent in the uh, time-restricted animals. So next, we tested a, a ketogenic diet, and we wanted to find out if we just gave animals a high-fat ad libitum diet, so no uh, restricting the time they eat here. This is purely just going to be uh, just a ketogenic diet all they want. Uh, we found that they also had a reduction in the, um, the, cyst the amount of cysts that were formed. Uh, in this model, though, there was a re they did not grow at the like they did not grow normally. Uh, we think that this is probably due to the low protein content of the diet. Uh, but we do know in humans this might not be the same effect because there are children that have you know that have been successfully treated with the ketogenic diet for many years. There is some growth uh, defect, but it's not at the same level you see in these uh, these mice and rats. So we think that this might be uh, secondary. So we're not sh we're not really con too concerned about this. Um, they all, other than that, they were phenotypically normal. Uh, and they also ate the same amount of calories relative to their body weight. So this was something, this was not just a caloric restriction thing. This is probably due to some other effect. Um, the same thing we saw here, we saw that these animals also had a uh, reduction in the uh, mTOR signaling um, relative to the uh, ad libitum normal chow animals. And we also saw, again, a reduction in these um, these smooth actin cells. So this is probably, the, again, the same effect, that these cells are probably very glucose dependent and we're um, just starving them out. That's probably one of the things we think is going on. Uh, and again, fibrosis is, is, again, knocked very far down. This, is be, this, is, this would be great if you could see this kind of progression in a human. So in summary for the second part, um, both the ketogenic diet and time-restricted feeding were, were successful and able to treat this disease or reduce its progression. Um, each one of these diets was not due to caloric restriction, so we were able to show that just by the, how much uh, the animals actually ate. And it seems that both these dietary, um, dietary interventions are effective at reducing fibrosis, which is kind of the, the, the end problem of all of these of, of PKD, is that you just lose kidney function. And so this might be able to preserve kidney health longer if either one of these treatments are um, successful in humans. And so uh, kind of future implications and directions here is that maybe it's possible to treat PKD with dietary intervention. Uh, because people find out very early on in life that they have this disease, uh, people know like that there is an option for using citrate, for instance, or uh, foods that might be low in either oxalate, phosphorus, or uh, other things that might be forming uh, uh, crystals or stones. They might be able to slow the disease progression and then that will keep them uh, healthy for many more years. Uh, right now, we're currently collaborating with some, uh, some, some people in Germany that are, uh, we're going to start doing a, a clinical trial just for um, safety, but that's going to take a while to find out. So we're going to see if uh, any of these interventions are, are feasible in a, um, you know, in a human context. So hopefully people can follow along. Uh, it's always a concern whenever you have a dietary intervention that can people <laughs> follow a dietary strategy. So we're trying to figure out what is the dose needed here, like, you know, because ketogenic can be hard for people. Um, not eating is very hard for people. So anything that makes it more palatable, uh, you know, might be, uh, make it more successful. So with that, uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators. There's a lot of them. And um, this is a picture of Santa Barbara. This is kind of, you can see my building in, in the back there. So sometimes it's hard to get work done if you're just staring out the window. Um, but in thinking about going outside <laughs> and there's research to be done. So um, with that, thanks everybody and I'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Jacob. We have plenty of time for questions. So if you guys would like to step up to the mic, you're welcome. Thank you for giving your tip shows. So I was wondering if there was any yeah. benefit to combining the two 
technologies in order to be a, you know, and implement testing. I know, that's, so that's, you know, we're, the scope of all, you know, there's so many different ways to combine this together, and yes, that would be, that would be a way to, we want to do, I would love to do that experiment. It's always just about, like, timing, money, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, and we're thinking that at this point it might only be a marginal increase considering how efficacious both of the treatments were. And that's another thing is like generally doing experiments, you don't want to show like a 5% or 6% increase. You want to get those big effects. And both of these diets had such a big effect on the, um, the cystic progression. Like there was like a 20 to 30% reduction in cystic progression in these both of these models. And that's that's pretty profound. So I think that if we were combined, then we might not get much more effect. Um, so it would, I think that you know that's, that would be a great experiment. Maybe somebody will do it. <laughs> so uh, absent in a human, uh, absent of taking that very difficult to come by stained slide uh, out of a human. Uh, uh, so what would you uh, suggest for diagnostics, uh, blood tests, uh, MRI? Uh, can you um, help with how to, uh, in a general sense, uh, diagnose the uh, function of the kidney? Uh, are you saying like how do they how do they do kidney function now for PKD patients? Yeah, how would patients? you recommend a someone who has uh, intermittent kidney pain and, and stone problems uh, to proceed with diagnosing their kidney situation? Well, so they the, there's a couple different ways they measure kidney function. So it'd be like estimated uh, glomerular filtration rates or the eGFR. That's the kind of the standard way people do kidney function. Uh, the people that have PKD, they they that they go in maybe once or twice a year. Uh, you know, every other year to get measurements. Um, if you wanted to find out, like, how far it's progressing, they'd have to do MRI or uh, CAT scan to see those things. Both of those are expensive, so people generally don't do them. They just kind of measure what their kidney function is. And right now, people don't even think about kidney stones as an issue. Like, they know that they, people get them that have PKD. They're not thinking about preventing them or you thinking about them as actually causing, you know, per, you know, the worsening of the disease. So it's kind of like, it's, I know, I just don't know, people, if you wanted to do it, you'd have to go through great expense yourself to just look at all your numbers, make sure that every, your kidney function is, st is maintaining, and that's all they have right now. They really don't have any other. What was the, the, the name for that kidney function test? Uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate. So it's just a calculation based off of some different uh, numbers they get from your, uh, your urine and blood, and they can figure out, like, how you're, you're doing it. They can do a direct measurement, but that's generally not done. Thanks for, thanks for sharing your research with us. I thought it was a really clear presentation, which is sometimes hard to come by with <laughs> like pure science. Um, I was wondering, I, maybe I didn't catch it, but how, like how long did you test the time-restricted feeding window? And then um, if you maybe doubled that time, do you think that the, the diseased rats would catch up with the, um, with the treated diseased rats would catch up with the untreated uh, in terms of fibrosis and Yeah, okay, so we, we, uh, so we treated them the same time frame. I didn't put that in there, sorry. Uh, week three to week eight. So the animals are weaned at week three. So that's kind of like the earliest we'd want to start doing this treatment. And then week eight is just a convenient time point. That's when they are generally considered adults. Uh, I don't think that they would progress further if we, if we kept them on this regimen because the, the most of the cysts are formed early on, so that they kind of like progress, progress, and then they kind of stop, and they kind of the kidney function starts to go down, but the cysts don't necessarily grow more of them. Um, so it would be it, we're tr we want to do this in adults. That's kind of the next experiment we're trying to fix, see if this is actually can regress some of these cysts, and that's kind of the, always been the big issue is like a lot of these treatments, like you can treat animals early on and they they don't progress, but can we actually treat somebody who has advanced PKD? That would be really the, that'd be the, the best thing ever because once fibrosis sets in, uh, that's generally considered irreversible. But, I, you know, there, might, there are mechanisms that the body has to, to reverse fibrosis, just how do you encourage those or promote those in a, in a damaged kidney. And so if we could, you know, if that happened, we would we'd be done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Jacob. Hello. You know, I read a lot of kidney <laughs> articles. <laughs> few thousand of them, and, and <laughs> my take on kidney research is that a huge majority of it is either in rats or monolayers of either dogs or human cells, not in vivo in humans necessarily, but it sounds like you're talking about designing studies in humans at this, like you guys are now transitioning with your German group for human studies, right? Yeah. Okay, and then there's a couple of categories here. There's people at risk 
for PKD who don't express the disease yet and the prevention mindset that you mentioned earlier. And then you're just saying about, well, we know they're already in disease state, the diets work. But then it sounds like we're talking about at least three interventions, possibly citrate salts, certainly in the prevention stage, with the, without any other dietary changes like supplements versus are you doing any studies that include a, an arm that includes just citrate salts? No, they've never. The citrate stuff has never been explored. Unfortunately, that there's a lot. <laughs> it's it's interesting because that God. research was done in the 90s. There was a um, George Tanner was he, he did all this research, and he showed that the the disease was bad, like these animals did not progress the same as the um, as their you know their their controls. And they tried it in a different PKD model, a mouse model, and nothing happened. Uh, and the reason they think, you know, now we'd probably, we would conclude that that's because they don't form kidney stones. So mice just are the, wor they don't, they're non-stone stone formers. Yeah. So we can't even use those as models. So rats are the classic uh, crystal stone form model. And so that's why we had to use those. And he was using rats. So it probably was the same thing I showed at the beginning. We treat with citrate, they go, the crystals go away but they couldn't explain it. Like they didn't know why that was the case. And so that research kind of just died there. They couldn't get anybody to pick it up. And also citrate is free and you know, it's, it's no patent and it's uh, cheap. Anybody can get it. So there's no drug company that will support research for that. And it's just difficult to do it for that reason because doing a human trial would be very expensive on citrate. And speaking of expensive, I'm thinking about in human trials, what's your timeline that you would need to follow up patients either in a prevention would be longer than a treatment style intervention, right? Yeah, so it'd be, so I think two years is around the- That's the, enough? That's usually the marker because PKD progresses at a consistent, like a steady rate at, um, in adults. So if you can just show that you have no progression, that's, the, that's all you're looking for. Uh, if you maintain kidney function and progression doesn't go go down or the progression is not increasing, that's all they look for. So like with this uh, tolvaptin treatment, that's all the metrics they were looking at was like, does the kidney, is kidney function staying the same or is total kidney volume staying the same? And it, you know, just small, small changes that apparently gets you approved. So if that's, it seems like you, it wouldn't be that tough to, to do the experiment. So in a human trial, why wouldn't it be easy or, I mean, it's expensive outside of the expense and the headache of another group, why wouldn't one of the control or treatment groups be a citrate group without dietary intervention? Uh, well, I think it's also just like access to patients too. So like, you, you know, the, like the cohorts that- So you, you wouldn't want to work with people that aren't normals, they would all be- These are all PKD yeah. patients, right? So, you know, you like where the people we're working with, they have a cohort of PKD patients that they can, um, that are ready to go into a trial and that's generally the other hard part of performing any clinical trials. You need to have people that can sign up for the trial. And so these patient databases are kind of guarded by, you know, different gatekeepers. And so getting access to those is another challenge. So, you know, we just, you know, to do multiple arms, it just increases not just the cost, but just the number of pa patients you need. And then your controls too also have to change. So that's also another problem. <laughs> Can I do a, just a little advertisement for kidney health? Okay. <laughs> As a nutritionist, um, our biggest nutrient deficiency is potassium. Nobody talks about it. Everyone talks about magnesium and how deficient we are in that. Those both come in citrate forms. I highly re recommend that everyone use those. <laughs> Fascinating research, Jacob, and really promising results. That's Thank you. Congratulations. Um, uh, apologies ahead of time for the kind of scattered form of this unquestioned. <laughs> but I, I, I'm intrigued by the uh, critical role of mTOR. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm more aware of mTOR inhibition through protein restriction. Mm -hmm. So it may not matter to you guys given your results, but how do you tease out the effects of glucose deprivation and protein limitation. How do you know what's really <laughs> inhibiting your mTOR, and how does this tie into what your actual macros were on your version of the keto diet? Right. So this is always uh, this is always a, a big question, right? Like how how do you how do you know like where the effect is coming from on mTOR? So uh, for the time restricted feeding, it almost certainly the protein restriction is the effect. That is how mTOR is being inhibited. I mean, that's 
we, that's pretty well researched that you know fasting inhibits mTOR and that's through like leucine deprivation, right? So I think that's pretty clear. And the uh, ketogenic diet, you know, they're getting a um, they're getting enough they're getting protein they're getting all of the, the the protein they need to survive. So mTOR should be ostensibly active in these animals, right? So it's not going to be off. Um, but there's something else that is that is causing the cyst to form. So in this model, we're, we're thinking that that's where the glucose deprivation, so that's how we're trying to tease apart glucose deprivation versus protein restriction. So time-restricted feeding, that would be protein restriction. Glucose deprivation would be the ketogenic model because the mTOR should still be on, right, at some level. Some it has, to, it has to be on. You make proteins, right? But, so but Downregulated certainly in the feeding window yeah. case. Or well, so, so down so downregulate. Well, you'd also expect that when you restrict protein, you have mTOR inhibition, but then you have like a um, an accentuated activity following when you refeed, right? So I think that's one of the other things is you get this compensatory mechanism where um, after mTOR is uh, you know is downregulated for that 16-hour window when you refeed you get a much stronger mTOR signal for, it's like punctuated. And so the punctuated thing is probably where it's, it's healthier. I mean, that's probably just where most times we should live in that punctuated uh, level rather than that just on all the time. Because it also, the you know, mTOR, it's, this, it's such a complicated signaling pathway because there are a lot of other inputs that mTOR um, is regulated by, like AMPK, like we know that a lot of this is through AMPK signaling. So in the uh, context of the ketogenic diet, you're probably regulating mTOR more directly through AMPK um, being active. Um, so also, you know, your mTOR exists in two different complexes. It has this mTORC1 and mTORC2 complex, and you're probably shifting, you know, that, that the, you know, where, where mTORC is residing in between these two complexes when you're changing what the macronutrient ratio is. And so that's another, another thing that we don't know exactly, like how that plays into everything, because the mTORC2 complex is involved in regulating autophagy and that um, kind of cellular repair pathway. And so, you know, is that another component of this? It's like probably, you know, it's um, 16 hours usually is not long enough to get into autophagy itself, but it might be, um, you know, playing a role, a minor role. Longer duration fasts would um, be more potent activators of autophagy. And so part of my, uh, you know, I didn't talk about any of this, but I'm doing research now looking at longer duration fasts because we found that um, longer duration fasts actually are very good at um, slowing down the disease progression as well. So that's kind of the next step is like looking at like, can we like just, you know, just completely fast these animals for long periods of time and get a, the same outcome. And on that issue, the difference in their metabolism plays a role too because if you're doing feeding windows of only eight hours, it may be equivalent to a three-day fast in a human, as, as I understand it. Yeah, mice and rats have a much faster metabolism, so there is a, there is a big difference in trying to figure out, like, what, what, is a, what would be, you know, the same thing in a human. Mice, you know, you fast them for a single day, they, they lose, like, 10 to 15 percent of their body weight, and they also get to BHB levels of, like, 3 to 4 millimolar in one day, which is humans would never, <laughs> never get that level of ketosis in a day. And, uh, you know, the rats, it can take several days to get up to, like, 2 millimolar. So it's, again, like, it's, they're so different in that regard. Um, it makes doing the experiments a little more challenging for the translational side. Um, but it's, it, the efficacy of, the ex of these things is, is really good. So we're hoping that maybe it will um, be translatable. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jacob. So, okay, we're going to wrap up here. We're now off to lunch and primal play, and then sessions will begin again at 1.50.